Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. It's just amazing how one kid can inspire others. It's not just what they're seeing, but how they're seeing it, and that introspection is pretty magical. The revolution is love, and love always wins. Today on Spotlight, a lady full of love on this Valentine's Day, cooking for the homeless. Plus, an exhibit about self-reflection from artists all over the globe. And then, an unlikely romance during World War II between two supposed enemies. But first, one kid's love of business turns him into the youngest vending machine owner in the country. It's Sunday, and you're watching the Emmy Award-winning Spotlight. Mikey Wren is a typical 12-year-old boy. Our mission is to create a vending company that builds strong relationships, offer competitive prices, and provides quality service. Well, almost. Mikey also runs a successful independent vending machine business, Mikey's Munchies. I remember I asked my mom for something at the vending machine, and she told me no. But she told me all the money that you put into those machines goes to the owner. But if you had your own, all the money would go to you. So then I was like, you know what? I want vending machine. I really thought no. <laughs> and another thing that's being added onto my plate. But I gave him some busy work, and he did the busy work. So I told him to go do a business plan, go do market research, and tell us where to get the machines from. And he did it within two days, and he brought it back to us, and he was like, I got it. And I'm like, you got what? And he was like, I got it. I got my business plan. So then me and my husband had to sit down and have a conversation about getting him these vending machines because we didn't have the money. So we had to come up with a game plan. Okay, you have to do a lemonade stand to get this money. And we were shocked. The first day he made over $600 and serves as the youngest vending machine owner in the nation. Six of them are in Jenny's. Three of them are with a company, Boeing. I have a, like uh -huh. a contract with Boeing. I have one at the Magic House at May, and I have two in Creve Corps. But he hasn't stopped there. After garnering success with his business, Mikey went on to write two best-selling children's books that both offer perspective, and advice for other young entrepreneurs. That whole process started with his third grade teacher and she didn't know how to approach me to tell me that my son was struggling in third grade. And she was like, it was intimidating for her to come to me and say, your son cannot read. So I went back and said, what do we need to do? And she said, as a team, we need to come together and get a game plan for him. And her game plan was to journal and make sure he's journaling every day and just writing down what he did and then question him about what he did. And so that's what we started to do. And it started to read as a book. So we asked him, hey, do you want to publish a book? He said, yes, we published the book. Well, I self-published the book. And then within that first day, he hit the bestsellers list what was inside my journal, what was going on inside my life. So the lemonade stand, the vending machine company, which quickly turned into the book, Mikey Learns About Business. And although Mikey was finding success in the world of business and becoming an author, Mikey's family had to overcome their own challenges. So many people don't know, my mom just got done battling breast cancer. So her still helping me with my vending business, her motivating me, telling me, come on, we got to go, we got to keep going, we got to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And her just setting me up, like, because if she didn't make it, she just wanted to make sure that I was set up and my sister was set up as well mm -hmm. for life. I just really want to appreciate you guys for coming. This event nearly sold out, so that just really just warms up my heart. Take risk and take chances because you only get one shot at some stuff. So if you don't take the risk or don't take the chance, that's an opportunity that you probably missed. And just as Mikey has been motivated throughout his journey, he now inspires and motivates others to take risks and to live out their dreams. I felt fire get lit up under me. It's just amazing how one kid can inspire others. I think it's awesome that he has taken his creativity to this level. I don't do like much talking. I let my actions like show. Just like the lemonade stand, making $1,200 in three days. Not many people is doing it. So I just let my actions show. 
Follow HEC Media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. These pots are banging for a very good reason. We bang revolutionary pots. The revolution is love, and love always wins. Meet Mama Cat, activist and pot banger from way back. My mother was a cook. I lived in a tenement in the Bronx. I could look up at the window, and the windows were fogged up. And when you go inside the door, you can hear them pots banging and clanging. So I said, I want to be a pot banging when I was a kid, specifically for the family. And that is just what she has become. Today, Mama Cat and her team of volunteers feed the hungry on the streets of St. Louis. Pot Bangers is a registered 501c3. We are a nonprofit organization. We provide care, comfort, and nourishment. We cook 150 meals each Thursday. We aid families that don't have enough to make it through. We partner with a lot of different awesome community groups and that help get people off the street into housing. So, you know, we try to fill in gaps. That's our role in life is to fill in gaps. It all began during the Ferguson Uprising. I met Mama Cat during the Ferguson Uprising because she showed up after a really rough night when police had been um, tear gassing people and it was three o'clock in the morning and everything else was closed and people were hungry. And she showed up and she popped open her trunk and she had like a full tray of fish and a full tray of chicken. And I think she's just a really incredible person who like inspires community and brings people together um, as part of building something a lot bigger than one person. Mama Cat believes that food is love. You know, when you break bread, you break down walls. If they have a, a chance to talk, everybody has a story. And it's quite amazing. We have to remember that these are our mothers and fathers, our brothers and sisters. These are our children. I don't feed the homeless. I go out and I fellowship with my unhoused family. I want them to know that we love them. When I go out on the street, I get hugs, I get love, and you know what, that do more for me probably than it do for them. Of course, she could not do this alone. I have a crew that come from every walk of life, every background. You got black, white, brown, you got straight, gay, and trans. You see Corrine down there, she's 82 years old, and then we have the young ones. They are the spirit in the face of lots of hostilities that the unhoused people face, like we can do something to show a little bit of kindness. For Mama Cat, her own history is a big part of why she does what she does. Back in 1989, I was in San Diego, California, and I had three children. I had one situation and we ended up homeless. And I know what it's like to, for people to look over you like you don't matter, like you don't belong. When you are one who have the least among everybody, people tend to overlook your humanity. And I said, if I ever got in a position where I can be a help, that's what I'm gonna do. You don't have to have a lot to make a difference in somebody's life. For me to know somebody had a full belly, that's a joyful moment for me. If they don't have a place to lay their head and I can be that difference that get them on their road to being housed, that's wonderful. So I have so many, I'm so grateful for so much. Boundless energy and her affection for humanity is what keeps Mama Cat doing what she does. When we can say that we help people find their way back to homes when they're not hungry, once we done all that, we can say mission accomplished. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. We're here at the Foundry Art Center hosting the latest exhibit, Self-Reflections, juried by St. Louis-based visual artist and educator, Natalie Baldion. As Natalie went through and jurored the exhibit, there wasn't a restriction on media, and so what we have is a fantastic representation of sculpture, photos, hyper-realistic oil paintings. And with that, there's something for everybody, so it's pretty great to have this wide breadth of not just themes of interpretation of self-portraiture, but this diversity in expression and craft. 
we have artwork from all over the world, actually, in this, this exhibit, so that's kind of exciting that we have uh, such, uh, so many artists, and uh, I think there's 53 uh, artists represented, all the way from London to Texas to right here in the St. Louis region. The theme of the show was about self-identity and how the artist sees themselves through self-portraiture. And being a new team coming in and immediately getting into flipping the gallery, putting in self-reflections, working with over 53 artists, it's pretty great to have this as the first show. I think it's just very appropriate to have a self-reflection themed show as the first exhibit myself and this new team puts forward to the community. I mean, it's right on the money. We have such an enthusiastic team. Everybody here is dedicated to being involved in the arts, to reaching out to the community and fulfilling our mission. And at the end of the day, really, it's, it's just, it's so much fun to see people come in and having this available to our community is, um, is fantastic. And, and that's, that's, why we, uh, that's why we do what we do. As guests come through the exhibit, after they've seen the works, they've done some self-reflecting themselves. And that engagement is really something that, as an arts administrator, I enjoy. And I enjoy watching people uh, as they come through the gallery. And it's not just what they're seeing, but how they're seeing it. And that introspection is pretty magical. Moving forward, that's where the Foundry is going to be more focused on programming that is, uh, that is outward facing to the community and engaging our regional community. The door is open and it's free to come in for anybody who wants to swing by and just kind of see what's going on here. And while you're here checking out Self Reflections, be sure to see New York based artist Sarah Sipling's show, Protest Print. This exhibit explores current socio political issues through various printmaking and collage methods. Self Reflections is on view at the Foundry Arts Center until February 26th. For more information, please visit foundryartcenter.org. A jazzy Valentine's Day song for you later on Spotlight. So here's a question. Which of the Allied countries in World War II, in desperate need of nurses, turned away thousands of qualified patriotic volunteers simply because of their race? Society at large didn't want to see black women in uniform. So a very small number actually served. And Eleanor Powell was one of them. Like many black nurses in World War II, instead of tending to the wounds of their countrymen, they were assigned to care for German prisoners of war being held in the United States. The army theorized German soldiers who had been fighting on behalf of a racist regime would not become attracted to women of color. Apparently, Frederick Albert missed the memo. How did they meet? <laughs> it's a great story, really. Um, so apparently, uh, Frederick, his assignment was to work in the mess hall because he was a, a great cook and an excellent baker. And this is what he shared with his children and, his, uh, and other family members. He said he saw her when she walked in, and it's like he was under a spell. Frederick and Eleanor became enemies in love. I think it was youthful rebellion. I think they also were madly in love. But they were, they were taking major risks. I mean, here you are, have an American nurse in the army, and he's in Hitler's army. So we are enemies at war. So she could have been court-martialed had um, their romance been uh, discovered. But now their story has been discovered by journalist Alexis Clark, who spent years documenting this incredible story of courage in a time of war and marriage in a time of hate. It's a collision of Jim Crow and Nazism. Even though we're at war, these are two countries that have racialized laws. So they both were committing crimes. So you really think about, wow, they just, they erased all of that. And so I think, yes, it was, they're, they're young, they're rebellious, but they also hated what their countries were um, putting forth and, and selling this racism, because that's, that's not what were in their hearts either. And there probably weren't too many people who had the same experiences, background, attitudes in the Army. The fact uh, that uh, they would find each other is pretty amazing. I think so too, because they really weren't ever supposed to be with each other when you think about 
that time period. Well, really, it's called, I mean, it's called enemies in love, but they weren't on that level enemies at all. It seems like the enemies were their own country men and women. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Do you think if they would have met somehow later in life, older, they would have gone ahead and, and gotten together? Or was this sort of a, I know. a moment of youth? I think youth was on their side for sure. Um, and not that you're young, that you're not thoughtful, but I do think there is something, um, just there is more wisdom um, and more fear as you get older. You know what this world can be like. So I think it helped them that they um, hadn't experienced that much of life yet. Well, the book is Enemies in Love, and it's terrific. And Alexis Clark, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. A profound feeling overcame Frederick when he spotted a beautiful, tall black woman. Incapable of concentrating on his kitchen duties, Frederick bypassed the POW waiters and walked right up to Eleanor. He looked her in the eyes, smiled, and said with a German accent, you should know my name. I'm the man who is going to marry you. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview to hear more details about their beautiful love story. With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, experimental or a classic. The arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. And lift off. The perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet successfully launching and traveling through space. That's challenging, but not nearly as difficult as landing the Perseverance rover in what has become NASA's most ambitious mission to Mars. Launched in July 2020, Perseverance is the newest generation Mars rover. It's high tech, NASA's most sophisticated rover ever built, and it's the biggest to land on the red planet. Perseverance is the first part of a multi-billion dollar effort to bring Martian rock samples back to Earth. Scientists are looking for ancient life on Mars. The countdown to the February 18th landing is excitement mixed with high anxiety because NASA scientists say it's the most critical and most dangerous part of the mission. Entering the Martian atmosphere at more than 12,000 miles an hour, Perseverance will streak across the sky like a meteor for seven minutes before finally touching down. NASA scientists are calling the sequence of landing maneuvers the seven minutes of terror because it's all done automatically. So you come in through the atmosphere at, at miles per second and use an aero shield and a parachute and then the sky crane to land wheels first. And there's a cable that comes down about 30 yards with the sky crane, this rocket thing, kind of suspended. And the cables are cut automatically and the sky crane goes off and then you've got a rover on the surface. That's the most difficult part. If anyone in St. Louis knows about this nail-biting descent, it's Ray Arvidson. The Washington University in St. Louis professor played a significant role in several rover and lander launches and landings. He's deputy principal investigator for the highly successful Mars exploration rovers Spirit and Opportunity. He's currently a NASA science team member for the Curiosity rover in charge of path planning. And he is the director of the NASA Planetary Data System Geosciences Node. This means his campus facility will be archiving all the Perseverance data. All their data products 
images, chemistry, mineralogy, organic content posted through our websites. Everybody's going to be coming to us to figure out what the context was for all the observations. But landing on Mars comes first. Arvidsson even helped choose the landing site for Perseverance. Which is Jezero Crater with this big eroded delta. And we're continuing to provide images and other pieces of information that help the science team once they land and start traversing where to go to get the best samples. Once safely on the surface, Perseverance and its science team will search for signs of ancient life and collect samples to be returned to Earth. Arvidsson is part of the team that created those specifications. So we've been trying to get, that is the community, <clears throat> arguing with NASA and Congress and the president all the way back to the 1970s to return samples to Earth. So the whole idea is to go to a place drill and get the samples, put them out on the surface to be returned by a later mission. Why is it so important? Because you can do many, many, many more very detailed analyses in the laboratory than you can do from a rover. Over the years, Arvidsson, fellow scientists, and rovers experienced many milestones, finding evidence that Mars once had fresh water and signs of microbial life. Now Perseverance is sent to accomplish even more. Even the name Perseverance is fitting for the role Arvidsson has played. Partly because it took so long to get this mission. So there was Perseverance. How do you like the name? I like the name except, you know, Opportunity, which was the rover I was the deputy principal investigator for, wound up uh, sitting on Perseverance Valley. What's the last time we heard from it? Uh, after a huge dust storm in June 2018, but that's okay. They can have the name for the mission, but I always remember Perseverance as the, the last place that our Opportunity rover traversed. Which carries some sadness. For all Arvidsson has done and will do, so much is on the line the moment Perseverance enters the Martian atmosphere. This is a mission that I've been pushing for since the 70s, and it's the first step in getting really characterized samples from known geological environments back on Earth. So I really want to see it succeed. We are here at the St. Louis Artist Guild for the Printin Exhibition. The exhibition focuses on national and local printmaking artists working in a variety of printmaking techniques. Within the exhibition, the diversity of techniques is really evident. In some prints, you're seeing lithography techniques, which comes from drawing on a limestone with a grease crayon. Um, and then in other prints, you're seeing techniques using silkscreen, which is typically used for commercial purposes for making t-shirts and other large media. You also have traditional mediums like etching and letterpress focusing on different ways of using a matrix that are very historical in nature. A lot of people think of printmaking as being like a digitally outputted print. Currently within the printmaking world, some artists are using that, but a lot of the work being exhibited take on traditional mediums that were created from years and years ago that are still being used today to create a lot of artwork. Visitors coming into the gallery, I think, should think about the historical connotations of printmaking. Um, printmaking has a long history within being used as a political driving force, along with giving information to the masses. So think about how this work is giving information to the masses. Also think about how artists are utilizing different techniques that are not typically used by a lot of artists these days. Within the exhibition, I think there are several artists pushing the limit with printmaking. Within the contemporary print world, there are lots of new techniques being utilized and seeing how these artists are manipulating these mediums to push their concept forward. The Artist Guild loves to exhibit work that covers lots of different mediums um, and 
showcases artists within St. Louis along with exhibiting artists that are from all over the nation. Printon essentially focuses on these techniques. We here at the Guild also have printmaking presses that students can take classes and learn these techniques um, that are being shown in this exhibition. So I think this exhibition brings to light a lot of techniques that artists are using, but also if people find that interesting, they can take classes here with us. The exhibition continues on through February 20th, 2021. For more information, please visit stlouisartistsguild.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. I seem to need less sleep when I'm in love And yet I don't count sheep when I'm in love And I am much less rude when I'm in love I eat much less food when I'm in love and every morning glory that I see Yes, yes, yes Seems to envy me You're rearranging me People see the change in me Everybody says that I could want for president You make my heart just jump for joy You make this great big world a shiny toy And there's a great big smile up on my face for the whole ever-loving human race And there's a few tricks I could teach the sun I know you could In the blue above The, the reason, reason I'm so lyrical Life is a miracle when I'm in love I seem to need less sleep. Isn't that nice it how is that happens, lovely. right? And you know I don't really ever count sheep. You never did, did Not you? so much, no. Well, I am much less rude. I haven't noticed that, Marilyn. I eat much less food. I haven't noticed that, Billy. Right. And every morning glory that I see seems to envy me. You're rearranging me. People see the change in me. Everybody says that I could run for press. You make my heart just jump for joy. You make this great big world a shine and joy. And there's a great big smile upon my face for the whole ever loving human race. And there's a few drinks I could teach the sun. In the blue above The reason I'm so lyrical Life is a miracle when I'm in love The reason I'm so elated You were created for me I'm in love Next week, for one St. Louis family, every month is Black History Month. Plus, an animal rescue takes over an elementary school and turns it into a shelter. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.